Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the series strategy game, and I'm very excited because we are going to start not one but two new series today. And the reason for that is I have read up a little bit on strategic bombing in World War II, especially the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, and I thought it would be very fun to see how that is, you know, implemented in games. So we're going to start two new series today. One of them is going to be a Hearts of Iron series, where we're playing as the United Kingdom, trying to bomb Germany into submission. And the other one is this. This is War in the West. I haven't featured that on my channel yet, but I have featured Gary Grigsby's War in the East. And I do like this type of game. It's a very intricate game, you know. It's It models everything down to, like, individual rifles in World War II, and it is so incredibly detailed and so well researched so i'm very excited to try that out let me give you a little bit of a rundown of this game here and then afterwards the idea of the game will be to play this um and play it a little bit to find out how things go and i'm gonna mix in a couple of facts uh, about the united states strategic bombing survey that they did after world war ii to assess the actual damage that they did in world war ii by strategic bombing so I want to mix that in a little bit. Um, in the Hearts of Iron 4 series, I'll be mixing in more the evolve, how the uh, Royal Air Force evolved over time in World War II, uh, from the pre-war thinking uh, up until 1945. So that's uh, the more general level here. We'll be talking more about target selection and all of that. Because essentially, this is a game that is set, if you can see up here, in 1943. So this starts out in uh, mid-1943. In this case we are going to be playing as the Allies. It's turn-based, so we have one week turns, and turns are basically cut into pieces. So you've got the air phase where we're giving all of our air orders, and then we're going into the ground phase later on, uh, where we'll be basically moving our ground forces and doing all of the combat. And you can just see how detailed that is. So you can see all of these different elements are part of this division, um, and you can see just like the various different, let's say, aspects of this six-pound anti-tank gun uh, with its various different rifle elements in there, the gun itself, the accuracy, the ammo, the penetration, all of that. So, very interesting, very detailed game. Now, there is, of course, one issue in a game that is set in 1943, and that is Germany had lost the war at this point. They just didn't know it yet. So... In 1943, there's just basically no way how Germany could have won the war at all anymore. Definitely a big no-no. By 1943, everything is collapsing uh, around the Germans, but they are holding out and they are fighting back. So the issue here is Germany cannot win this war. So the way that the game deals with that is basically you are set up on a counter here where basically... Um, the game will go to you against certain points, against victory points, um, and it's trying to see whether we can, as a player, do better than the Allies did historically. So, it's not about winning against Germany. We are more or less guaranteed to win against Germany. It's about winning against Germany better than had historically been the case. And to that effect, the game models a couple of things, and one of them is it gives you a certain degree of ideas about which targets you should bomb. So, especially in 1943, um, one of the main targets of the Allied bombing offensive was actually the German U-boat fleet. And that is um, reflected in this game, in that the game really wants you, for example, uh, to bomb the U-boats. Now, one of the things that the strategic bombing survey found is that well, that didn't really work out as intended. It only did very minimal damage, especially uh, over here in sort of the French port uh, cities of so Saint-Nazaire, La Rochelle. These areas, uh, they were bombed pretty heavily, but really the Germans built up two strong fortifications there, so that didn't really go anywhere. And the game takes a slightly different spin. It wants you to build the um, building yards of these uh, U-boats. And the strategic bombing survey really found out that... Mm, this this didn't really work out as well. Except in very, very late 1944 and, and early 1945, uh, when the Germans did build the Electro boats, so the very new type of submarines that could uh, stay underwater for a very long time, there the bombers could actually do a lot of damage against the construction, and that led to significant delays in the deployment of these submarines. And I think only one single submarine ever made it um, on onto an actually uh, actual sortie. So, yeah, 
that might have been decisive at, at that point, but in 1943 it isn't. So one of the things that I want to do here is I want to diverge from that. I want to see, I want to find out whether we can in this game destroy the German economy and the German war machine by our strategic bombers and see what exactly we can do. So we are not going to try to go exactly for victory points here, but we want to try this out as sort of semi-historical gaming experiment if you want. So. I think that's very interesting, so I'm going to leave you a bit through here, and I'm probably going to start the actual bombardment or the actual game missions in the next episode, but for now we're going to talk a little bit about how this all makes sense, uh, what we've got, what our strategy will be, and all of that, or at least the initial strategy. So, of course, July 1943, uh, a lot of people will know that date, so... At this moment, of course, pretty much all of Europe, uh, or all of mainland Europe over here on this map, is under German control. So basically all of this um, until Spain down here. Spain is, of course, neutral in this time, uh, at least. And basically, well, everything else, I would say, except for Switzerland, um, is under German control. Except, of course, the United Kingdom. So we are basically based over here. Um, and you can already see there are quite a couple of airfields over here. So this is what is going to constitute our our basing grounds where we will be basing our fleets out of. So that's of course, let's say, the unsinkable aircraft carrier where the American and UK forces are going to be uh, based. In the UK, it's going to be mainly the Royal Air Force and especially Bomber Command and to a low degree also Fighter Command but uh, also the United States uh, 8th Air Fleet. So the Mighty 8th uh, Mighty is going to be based over here. At the same time though, the Allies have basically finished up in Northern Africa. So uh, basically all of this here, Tunisia, is under Allied control over here. And we're just about to land on Sicily. So this is Operation Husky, where the Allies uh, are landing on Sicily. And they are going to discover a couple of problems. Let's see whether we are going to discover them too. Uh, and we've got a couple of bomber fleets down here, of course, as well. And they're going to support that invasion. And um, at this point in time, we also control Malta, which is going to be an important uh, staging ground. And we do control this area up over here. So this Pontelleria, Pontelleria I, don't, I really don't know. I think it's a volcanic island. Um, not quite sure, though. Uh, but it is an important basing ground. So... All of this is at this point ours, um, and basically the Germans don't quite expect, they expect an invasion somewhere, but they don't know exactly whether it's going to be on Sardinia and Corsica, whether it's going to be on Sicily, or whether it is indeed going to be in Greece. So that's basically the geographical setup. Of course, the Russians are fighting way over in the east, so this is basically Poland. You can see the Pripyat marshes over here. Um, and somewhere there's going to be Minsk and Smolensk is, I don't even think it's on the map, so yeah. That's basically up to here to the east. This is not part of the game. We are only concentrating here on the western front. The eastern front, of course, is a completely different thing. Most of the German industrial base, uh, you can see basically, by the way, they have built up the west wall over here. So they've got a couple of different units here on the coast. And if you're wondering why we can see that these units is we are playing without Fog of War. And the basic reason for that is I want to find out just how much damage we're doing. Um, and, you know, historically it would be, of course, more accurate to do a Fog of War, but we want to find out just what exactly is going to happen. So that's the issue here. Let's talk a little bit about the economy in war in the West, as I understand it. And I must admit, I don't completely understand it. I'm not a pro in this game. This is the first time I'm really attempting a, a playthrough here. Uh, so if you have any tips, do let me know in the comments below. Uh, but the basic model is in the economy. Let's try to grab a bomber fleet here. And I think we can even select the target target. So let's grab bomber command over here. And you can see over here that if we are giving trying to give an order to bomber city, um, you can basically see that on the map over here, there are going to be a couple of uh, notifications about what is going to be in these cities. And just to talk a little bit about the uh, geography geography of Germany, this is basically the rural area where basically a lot of the German heavy industrial uh, plants are based. Then you've got Dusseldorf and uh, Wuppertal and down here Cologne. So this is a very, very densely populated and industrialized area. You've got the slightly smaller industrial centers of Mannheim, Nuremberg, Frankfurt, Frankfurt down there, Munich over here. 
that's going to be Berlin somewhere over there. And a couple of smaller uh, plants just around about Hanover, Leipzig, so this is Saxony uh, and Hamburg over there. So these are going to be the main areas. Uh, of course, at that point in time, Austria is also part of this, so there's Vienna uh, and, of course, all of Italy. Although the Italians at this point really not the strongest uh, adversaries. So, how does the economy work over here? Basically, you've got these different types of things that are being produced. You start out with resources, which are, for example, being produced down here in Düsseldorf, or this is currently damaged, so let's take another one, Iserlo, Iserlo over here is currently producing some resources. You can see they have two resource production plants uh, and they are going to be producing resources. Resources are then turned into... are going to go into heavy industry. So I think we can select none over here for a second. Um, and basically you can see all of the resources. So these are the areas that are producing resources. Uh, we can sort them by, let's say, the number, and we should see that Gleiwitz, which I think is somewhere in the east, and Bochum, which is definitely down here, and Essen. These guys are producing by far the most resources. I don't know exactly from the top of my hat how many each is producing, but all in all, I think I did note it down somewhere, uh, Germany is producing, I think, around about 1 million units of resource per week. So... These things are then going to be turned over towards the normal industry. So where can we see that? Heavy industry over here. And you can see again, this is going to be concentrated quite heavily over here in Essen, a little bit in Leipzig, Schweinfurt, which is in Bavaria, Turin, which is in Italy, of course, Berlin. So this is where the resources are then turned into supplies. Supplies are going to be again used in armament industries on the one hand so you've got all of these guys over here so you can see these are a little bit more smaller they are a little bit more dispersed throughout the country um, and they're going to be turned into armament points which are basically used to produce all kinds of the small items so like small guns if we look back over here uh, in terms of one of our units so basically most of this stuff over here is going to be produced via armament points and you will have armament points and they just be converted into let's say a Lee Enfield rifle or brand light machine gun. So that is basically the basic uh, or the the basic setup for most of the uh, units over there. But it's not quite everything. You've also got uh, one. You've also got let's say over here AFEs. So armament points or supplies actually can be used to produce certain named vehicles. So Panzers, Panzerjägers, Nathan, Stuks. Uh, basically all the setup of, of the German industry uh, and you can see they are not quite based all the way over here They are a little bit more dispersed throughout the country and um, a little bit of factories all over the place really that are producing various things You've got also aircrafts. So the Junkers, the BF 109s, these are the Messerschmitts uh, Transport aircraft basically all of the aircrafts are being produced somewhere on the map and basically by the way You can see none of them are being produced over here and um, you've got certain other things, some of which I don't even know. Of course, there are ports, rail yards, all of that manpower. So heavy population centers, resources. Uh, then we've got vehicles, which are going to be extremely important. And we're going to talk about them in a second. We've got U-boats, uh, which are mostly produced in Hamburg, Bremen. So over here and I think, well, along the coast, as you would expect. Some of them are even being produced in Donzig over here, uh, which I think would be one of the tougher areas to crack. But again, I don't think we're going to go for the U-boats. So, one additional item that is very important is oil. Oil, at that point in time, was mostly produced in Texas and produced in the Caucasus, so this area over there. Um, and none of these were areas that Germany did have access to. Um, also, the uh, Dutch East Indies in uh, sort of Indonesia. There wasn't really much being produced anywhere else. A little bit in northern Germany, and you can almost see that over here, but this is by far not going to be enough. The big oil fields at the time, the only ones that Germany did really have access to, are over here in Romania, Plötzi. I think it's over here. Yeah, right. So this is where pretty much most of the oil production is happening. You can see this alone, this here, is producing 60 oil per turn. Somehow it doesn't sort by that. I think it's only within stuff that's within range. So 
up over here, this is really the oil producing area. Uh, and because this is by far not going to be enough to fuel the German economy uh, and its war machine, they are using one other thing. And a lot of you will know that, of course, and that is the synthetic fuel plants. So this is basically where they turn coal, in terms of the game resources, into fuel. So that is, for example, quite heavily over here. There are very different um, areas over here. Notice there are also fuel production facilities. And fuel production facilities take natural oil, whereas synthetic fuel production refineries do take resources. I've played a couple of turns as Germany, and one thing I notice is the fuel production is pretty much irrelevant. Basically, Germany has twice as much fuel production capabilities as they do have oil. So, basically, if you if you destroy one of these production plants uh, or one of these refineries for natural oil into fuel, it doesn't really hurt them so much because they can take up that uh, slag from different fuel production facilities. So, that's not going to change much. But, the synthetic fuel refineries are one of the uh, points that we can hit. And that is bringing us to the first thing about the strategic bombing survey. Now, the strategic bombing survey noticed really in quite a number of things, two things. There was a lot of slack in the German economy in even 1943, even until late 1943, the German economy didn't really mobilize and wasn't really put on a war setting. They went with single, single shifts for, for quite a long time in the war, um, and they just didn't really efficiently manage a lot of things. They were very much focused on that sort of narrow, wide strategy where they built up a lot of factories quite fastly, but there wasn't uh, that much, let's say, a coordination between the factories uh, and all of that. So a lot of the things that the Germans did is they didn't really, they industrially wise, they, they didn't really, it was not a very well run organization. So in particular, that did allow the Germans to absorb quite a bit of punishment to their industry via the air bombardments for a very long time because it, before it was really felt. And that did affect a number of the industries. And I think it would be very true in this game um, if we were talking about the fuel factories. So. We're not going to attack the fuel factories, but we are going to try to attack the synthetic fuel refineries. There are a couple of ones in this game. There's the one in Stettin. There's a problem with Stettin. It's very far away. It's very far east. There's also Blechhammer, Blechhammer uh, which is over here around... Not Krakow. I think it's not in Krakow, is it? No, no, no. It must be... Yeah, it's over here at Katowice. So... I want to say Poland. Yeah, it's Poland, probably. Not Czechoslovakia. So it's Upper Slesia. So basically this area over here. This is by far one of the largest refineries. And the Germans didn't have that many of these things. They, depending on how you count, they had about 10, 12 uh, of these plants that were churning out about half their fuel. Um, and by the end of the war, they had a lot of problems getting enough fuel. So... We are going to try to exploit that and throughout the series fuel is going to be one of our main priorities. But for now let's look at one other target and that other target is vehicles. This primarily represents normal trucks. So just the sort of normal trucks that you had in day-to-day in -day life that you had pre-war. Uh, most of them were um, let's say tuned to military production and military needs. But these things are really what made the overall German war machine running. This is really the grease in their machine. And I think this might be a weak point in this entire setup. Now, in the war, the Allies didn't really specifically target or use vehicle plans or, or truck plans um, as one of the most important targets, which is interesting because they did actually attack a couple of them. I think they did attack the area here in Brandenburg, the, I think it was an Opel plant over here in Brandenburg. Um, and we're gonna get into the role of these, these plants quite a bit. So that one they completely destroyed. But some of the other ones, they didn't. And specifically one they, they very, very lightly damaged is the one at Cologne. So you can see this is the third largest plant over here. Uh, after Mainz, Zwickau, Cologne, Brandenburg. Cologne is one of the biggest plants, truck plants in Germany. 
and they supplied a large proportion of the German uh, of the German army with trucks, with just transport trucks. And it's kind of very interesting because this was a Ford factory. So this is the Ford Motor Works uh, building trucks for the German army in 1943. And the Allies are not really deliberately bombing it. They are bombing Cologne quite heavily, but not really the factory. And nevertheless, I did find at least one reference that they did reimburse Ford for some bombing damage after the war. Which I think is quite odd, because quite a couple of these things, uh, we will get into Ford and General Motors quite a bit, because you can see the largest plant is in Mainz down here. Now, I really tried hard to find out what this is supposed to represent. I I, I don't know. It's I, there. There's no, nothing in Mainz itself you can find, but there is the Opel plant in Rüsselsheim, which is just over here. It would be more fairly allocated in this hex uh, rather than Mainz. It's it might actually be a little bit closer over here even. Uh, nevertheless, I think this is what this is supposed to represent. And Opel at that time was owned by General Motors, at least to a large extent. So um, that's. Again, interesting to see that, you know, such a large part of the German motorization was driven by that. And again, the plant in Brandenburg as well. And then we've got the plant at Antwerp. Now, Antwerp, this is it in Belgium. And this is over here. And this is, in fact, going to be one of our first targets over here for airstrike. And we're going to get into that in a second. So let's actually set up a bombing raid over here so you can see sort of how it works. We are going to grab Antwerp. The city of Antwerp is going to be our target here. So... This is how this is set up. Now, it doesn't look exciting, but there is so much detail to this and I, I think it's so rich and so interesting. So basically the way this is works is our bombers are gonna to try to assemble over Harwich. Then they're gonna fly through this path over here and they're gonna come into Antwerp. We can change all of these things. We can pick a different base over here where these guys would start and you know, that wouldn't be a terrible idea. Um, and they would come in and they are gonna bomb Antwerp over here. So that's nice. We do need to pick first the targets over here. We're gonna allocate a, a very low probability to everything over here. You can see all of these different things. And we are gonna then prioritize very strongly, in fact, vehicles. So this is just a small factory, but it is very close. This is in Belgium. So this is very nice and, and close and easy. So yeah, let's bomb the General Motor Works in Antwerp. We're gonna use that. Next thing is we can pick which aircrafts are going to fly. And you can see there are various different aircrafts that we can pick. All of these have different proper, uh, properties. And the main bomber, of course, of Bomber Command uh, of the Royal Air Force is at this point the Lancaster Bomber. The Lancaster Bomber is the main heavy bomber throughout the war, really, um, or at least from, I want to say 1942, but I'm not quite sure. So these things are going to be our long range bombers. Now, we're going to set up a second strike soon. And I don't think we do need the heavy bombs to go to Belgium. I think we can take the short range ones. And there are a couple of short range ones, and that is specifically the Sterlings over here. Now these Sterlings, they have a very, very limited range indeed. I think they only have about 200 uh, mile range radius. So they can't really go far. So they're gonna come over here and they're gonna come and uh, gonna try to strike over here. We've also got the Halifax B2s over here. They also have a fairly low range. These are two engine bombers, very early bombers of the United Kingdom. Um, and again, they are not really that great. So yeah, we are gonna pick these guys and they are gonna be coming in here and gonna try to bomb. So that's a fairly good setup over here. I think this is something that we're gonna keep uh, throughout the war probably. Um, and that is fairly nice. Now, what you can do is you can go to one of these groups, let's say number 196 uh, IF level bomber squadron over here, and we can pick the loadout of these guys. And you can basically change the loadouts. We can have incendiary bombs, we can have mines, heavy bombs, various mix uh, loadouts. I think the one that we are gonna pick over here is this one with three 1000 kilo bombs, 10 uh, 500 pound bombs, couple of auxiliary pet tanks, no, sorry, this one, without any auxiliary tanks, so three 1,000 kilo bombs, 16 500 pound bombs. So that I think is a very nice setup. Um, it does mean that the endurance of these aircrafts is gonna be further limited, but it's a very short trip, so I think that's gonna be fine. And you can basically see all of the parameters over here, specifically the radius, 250 miles. That is pretty horrible, 
but that is indeed what we're going to pick. So all of the Sterlings should have that setup and all of the Halifaxes should have fairly similar setup where we are. Oh, no, this is not a good setup at all. I do not want to use incendiaries. I think just normal bombs here are going to be co completely fine. So, yeah, we're going to use that over here in all of these bombing groups. Um, and that, ah, you can't because a lot of you guys will now have not sufficient range uh, to get to this target, actually, because you have such a horrible, horrible range. So we're going to probably pull these guys down there uh, over a couple of turns so that they're going to be closer. You can see some of them are based in air bases pretty far up here in the north. Uh, but for now, what we're going to do is we are going to pick something that has a couple of auxiliary tanks here. And I think this is going to be fine over here. So instead of, you know, this two heavy bombs, two medium bombs, two light bombs, uh, we can get rid of the light bomb and grab a couple of auxiliary tanks. Uh, and I think that's going to be fine. And we're going to pick all of that. And that should allow them all to come in. Yeah, it does. You can see they are all, um, well, basically set up over there. We can also add, a, let's say, a bow fighter squadron over here. So maybe two. Um, so that these guys are escorted. So these guys are going to be escorted all the way. So that's fine. Uh, so that's all of the aircrafts that I want to pick. We can go for advanced options here. And since the turns are going to be one week each, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a couple of days when these guys are going to strike. Uh, and I think it's going to be fine if they strike, let's say, on three days towards uh, the later half of the week. So on, uh, let's call that Wednesday, Friday and Sunday. And I do think we can increase the altitude here a little bit. Uh, let me just double check how high the Sterlings can fly. I think they can only fly 19,000 feet. So that is going to be fine and we can't really fly higher. So that's going to be okay and lovely indeed. So uh, no, nope. uh, let me actually check one thing first. And that is we want to have a look out here for flak. So for anti-air guns. You can see uh, various different anti-air guns positions are around here. There are always two numbers, one for low flyers and one for high flyers. Now, of course, these guys are going to be flying relatively high at nearly 20,000 feet. So I do think the later number counts. I'm not quite sure, though. Um, and one thing to note is that this also counts for the adjacent hexes. So if we're going to fly this way, we're going to be adjacent to this flag battery over here. So I would very much like if we could come a little bit lower here. And you know what? I think this is perfectly fine and fantastic. And this way we won't have the same issue over here really. Well, I suppose no, this is not going to change anything. And you know what? I think that's fine. So yeah, let's confirm that. And that is the first air directive that we have over here. One important thing that we do need um, to do is we need to do another mission over here and actually do recon. And we're going to do that and we are going to pick again Antwerp and we want to find out just exactly how that position look like the uh, position looks like and we again are going to try to uh, avoid all of this flak concentration here I think we're doing it like that and that's fine um, and what we're going to do is we are going to pick uh, first a couple of groups over here I think just a couple of Spitfires are going to be fine so we're going to just pick and uh, this air group over here and we're just going to briefly check on these guys so you have mid-level cameras well that's interesting i suppose we could pick two can we yeah okay let's pick two of these groups let's double check whether they all have mid-level cameras they do mid-level cameras i do think means eighteen thousand feet so is that, is that correct let me uh look at my notes down here so, no, that's 24,000 feet. So that's what we're going to try to achieve over here, 24,000 feet. Uh, and one thing that we do want to make sure is that these guys are flying, let's say, towards the beginning of the week. So uh, that we have sort of a, a track here uh, that gives some indication before the bombers come in. So we want to find out just how exactly the factory looks before we send in the bombers. And that is going to be fine with this setup and I think fairly fantastic. So, yeah. Oh, we do need uh, to allocate target priorities here. Um, and indeed, we do actually need to tell you that this is a strategic recon and that the target priority here is going to be to set all of these guys very low, except for vehicles. That is going to be really the only thing that you're supposed to spy at over here. So this is just to demonstrate you how this game is going to work. And we're going to set this up all in the next uh, turn quite a bit. The one thing I want to leave you with is that the plant here in Antwerp was also 
a Ford Motor Works plant, or I think General Motors and Ford Motor Works plant. Um, and quite interestingly, after Belgium got overrun, I think Mr. Atzel Ford himself was asked whether it would be okay for the Germans to convert that plant into one for their military trucks, and he approved. Now, of course, at that point, the United States were not at war against Germany, so to some degree there wasn't really a good, good reason for that, but it is quite striking still how, you know, so much of the German war machine was powered by by American automobile manufacturers, and it really shows you just how dominant they were at the time uh, and how important in businesses, even even by far most European uh, production plans were, uh, were actually American companies. Now, one of the interesting factors about the Antwerp plant is that after the Allies captured that, and Antwerp was just in general a very important um, place for them to capture, and we're going to find out why, I think, later in the game. But, interestingly enough, that factory very, very quickly stopped producing trucks for the Allied side. So, even as the American army was sweeping through Belgium and, and uh, France and Europe, I think even between 1944 and up until the war end, they churned out like something like a ridiculously high number, like I think 30,000 or so uh, cars and and, uh, factor and uh, trucks for the American and British army. So I found that quite interesting and, and quite intriguing. That being said, I think now is a very good place to put in a cut. Let me know what you think about this this type of game. It's very board game type. Uh, I do like it. It's it's sort of so detailed and, and interesting. Um, and we're going to set up quite a couple of bombing runs in the next uh, episode. And of course, we're not going to regret, uh, neglect uh, the ground war completely. So we're going to start the invasion of Sicily at that point as well. So yeah, very much excited about next turn. Looking forward to, to meet you guys then. Do leave a like and all of that helps out enormously, especially for new series like that. Uh, and if you do like, uh, do have a look at the other series at Hearts of Iron 4 on uh, the other series. Bye bye guys!